we're going over the fields and through the woods to Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Hi there. Welcome to this here engineering podcast brought to you by the super nerds at eejournal.com. I'm Amelia Dalton, your podcast hostess, who just happens to be doing the robot right now. And why am I? You'll just have to trust me on this one. Doing the robot? Because we're talking about one of my all-time favorite subjects today, robotics. We're talking about getting your glass of wine or take out from the taco truck down the street delivered to your door by an autonomous vehicle. Yes. <laughs> my guest is Alan Martinson from Starship Technologies, and he's bringing a robot with him. And that robot is bringing snacks. <laughs> well, other stuff too. Check it out. Hi, Alan. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Emily. So, what is Starship Technologies all about? Starship Technologies is a firm which has been co-founded by two of Skype founders, Janos Fries and Dati Heinla, back in 2014. And we are building small, lightweight, autonomous delivery robots, which are probably the first social robots in the world because we are driving on pedestrian sidewalks. So the full goal of the company, obviously, is to bring down the cost of delivery and secondly, to increase convenience uh, for consumers. So we are pretty far ahead already in, in terms of development. We have around 15 or 20 robots already cruising on, on the sidewalks in different cities. And today, Portland is the 21st city we are adding to our map. We have driven around 3,300 miles on public sidewalks and probably starting our commercial trials sometime in Q3, Q4 this year. Now, this being an engineering podcast and all, I would love to know more details about your robots. Uh, can you give me and my audience some information about what's under the hood of your six-wheeled intelligent robots? Sure. First of all, Starship is based on pretty simple hardware technology. Most of the components you can probably buy off the shelf in any major city. It is equipped with cameras, equipped with you know, time-of-flight cameras, ultrasonic sensors, you know, GPS, basically a tablet processor and wheels and motors, of course, and gearboxes. But it's nothing dramatic at all in terms of hardware. So most of the secret source in this robot is about software. And maybe one of the key decisions that we made in terms of engineering was not to use LiDARs. And LiDARs has been a kind of go-to technology for most of the self-driving cars and also many robots. So we decided to bypass that, mostly because A, we don't really need it, and B, it's really, very really expensive, and we would like to build a robot which can do deliveries at $1 target price. So the secret source in, in terms of engineering in, in this robot is about software, and it's most about computer vision. We are using computer vision for a multitude of tasks. First of all, pinpointing our location with approximately one inch precision, and we are using basically 3D maps of the cities we are operating, which we are building ourselves. And the robot, when cruising on the sidewalk, is all the time looking around and comparing what it sees to what it should see and triangulating its position with approximately one inch precision. Secondly, we are using computer vision to create a kind of bubble of situational awareness around the robot. It's around maybe seven or 10 meters or 30 feet and we know everything what's happening within this bubble. So basically we see people, cars, bicycles, any obstacles which may pop up. When we stand still, we can see much further because it's much easier for computer vision to detect moving objects when standing still. And that's what we do when crossing the streets. We just cross the streets as any pedestrian would. We just stop, we look on both, both sides, we decide if there is any oncoming traffic, we decide if the traffic light is really green, and only then we proceed. So it's mostly a computer vision task we have been trying to achieve. So, Alan, what are the biggest challenges your team has faced in doing this project? You know, like with any other company and any other product, and the, the bottlenecks and the problems, they change and replace each other all the time. So you solve one problem and another one pops up. So initially, we were quite concerned about uh, social acceptance. We were concerned about humans, most of all, because uh, that's a robot which will be independently driving on the sidewalks. And many people predicted that it will not last for more than five minutes. So people will come and trash it and paint it over and try to steal it and so forth. 
nothing that has happened about any of that. So we have been now driving more than 3,000 miles and we have encountered 300,000 people. So none of those people have proved to be hostile to the robots. Just quite the contrary. People are really, really friendly or just ignore the robot. It depends on a city, busy city like London, for example, in a rush hour, so some people just walk past. If it's a farmer's market on a Sunday in Arkansas, and some people pay lots of attention, but it's always friendly. So that was one of our key concerns initially, but now it's kind of off the table. And obviously, obstacles are biggest hurdles. What we need to overcome is you know, to do mostly with situational awareness and our ability to drive independently and navigate with high precision how to react to different situations on the sidewalk, in traffic, and so forth. So, but we are quite confident that we can cope with that. So how many cities are your robots currently in? We have visited around 21 cities. So today, Portland is the 21st city that we have visited. We are running our testing at the moment in three cities, in Arkansas, in the United States, in London, United Kingdom, and Tallinn, Estonia. But we are planning to expand and increase our testing program in the coming weeks and months. So, Alan, looking at the next decade or so, where do you see robotics being in everyday people's lives? We are today approaching time when robotics will be everywhere. And one of the key reasons is that the cost is dropping quite dramatically and the abilities of the robots, they are growing. And we are one of the companies which are part of that trend. It would be much, much more difficult and very much more expensive to build such a robot like we are doing in, uh, five years ago. Today we can do it basically for a few thousand dollars and you can see robotic vacuum cleaners which cost only a few hundred dollars and lots of other consumer robotics. So I'm very, very bullish about the robotics in our daily lives and there is a good reason for that because there are lots of tasks that we can automate and lots of tasks that can be put on the shoulders of robots instead of humans. And the last line delivery is one of the most obvious of them. We believe in Starship that there will be around three robots carrying packages and groceries and physical goods for each car on the streets in approximately 20 years' time. And that's based on our calculations and showing how many goods and how many items need to be transported in the cities and how often people need to drive. So it's obvious that people need cars But goods, they don't need cars. They only need just little robots to carry them around. And that's what we are building. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Alan. This was super cool. Thank you. And it was really pleasant to talk to you. This week's fish fry and title is Robots A Go Go. So, keeping with our theme, I thought I'd throw you a little news you may have missed. Going, going, gone. Robotic Auction Edition. We'd all love a piece of NASA history, right? What if I told you you could not only own a piece of classic early 1960s NASA memorabilia, but that it also has eyes and is kind of creepy? You'd jump right on that, right? (laughs) Okay, I'm totally not joking. It is kind of creepy. So what we got here is a classic, straight out of Plan 9 from outer space, hydraulically powered robot called PDAD, or a power-driven articulated dummy. Now, don't be thrown off by that word dummy. This guy weighs in at over 200 pounds. Originally developed in the early 60s to test out spacesuits, this bad boy can simulate 35 different motions, has torque sensors in each joint, can swivel its hips, raise and lower its arms, shrug its shoulders, uh, clench its fists, and shake your hand. Adding to its creepy coolness, this piece of NASA robotic history also has removable aluminum skin, a glass fiber head with the creepy eyes, and has been suited up finely with a neoprene suit and boots. And get this, this PDAD measures almost six feet tall. So... This all sounded perfect for your next office Halloween mixer, or perhaps you're thinking maybe about taking Mr. P-Dad to your cousin's wedding in a month. I know, she is going to love that, right? (laughs) Well, he has seen some wear in the last uh, 60 years or so, 
He's lost a forearm, some of its wiring is damaged, and there is a fair amount of dents, scuffs, and dings. But, seriously, the only other one of these power-driven articulated dummies developed by NASA resides at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. So, of course, you'll want to scoop this one up. Unfortunately, and you knew there was going to be a catch, right? It's going to cost you. Bids for this spacesuit testing, slightly creepy 60s era robot are expected to exceed $80,000. And considering all 200 plus pounds, you'll want to keep in mind shipping costs as well. <laughs> if you want to find out more information about the NASA PDAD coming up for auction very soon, why it was created, and ultimately why it never saw any real action in the field. I've included a link below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And hey, if Google Plus is your thing, you can also join our circle on Google Plus. And we have a YouTube channel, keyword EE Journal. Chalk full of all kinds of techie videos, our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, and our video series called On the Scene. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. I'm just saying. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Fryin' page, you can also grab our Fish Fryin' RSS feed or subscribe to Fish Fry via the iTunes store. And remember, if you want any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology, any fun EE conference coming up that I absolutely should attend, or the best geeky hotspot in your city, shoot me a line at amelia at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of September 9th, 2016, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.